In 19th century New York, a series of gruesome murders remained unsolved for decades. The man who committed the crimes was Edward Ruloff, once called the genius killer. Ruloff was an intelligent and charming psychopath who used fake names and lived freely in society until justice finally caught up with him. Kate Winkler Dawson is a crime historian, professor, and podcaster. Her new book, All That Is Wicked, is a fascinating account of Ruloff's sinister crimes and Gilded Age mine hunters who examined him in a race to decode the criminal mind. and good to see you here and thanks for joining us to talk about your new book. Thanks for having me, I appreciate it. So All That Is Wicked is the story of Edward Ruloff. Mm -hmm. um, he's a criminal that you focus on in the book. Um, some, you, you say that some people called him the genius killer. <laughs> Can you describe him a little and tell us a little bit about him? Well, what's interesting about Ruloff was that he was a genius and he was a killer, but he was not a mastermind criminal <laughs> of, any, of any type. Uh, they were definitely two separate uh, qualities that he had. So Ruloff, just to, to summarize quickly, he was an expert in linguistics in the 1800s in upstate New York. Self-taught, knew more than a dozen languages, very well spoken, just at an incredible ability to memorize and understand philosophy and, and different language. And his dream was to uh, unlock this key to the origin of human language, which was a really big deal with, with linguistics in the 1800s. And the idea was that if you could find this pattern that he would be able to teach uh, someone who spoke only French how to uh, speak Italian within minutes. And so it was a lofty goal that was unrealistic, but he felt like he had it. And the thing with Ruloff was that when People got in his way, he had no problem removing them. And he was a very insecure man, and so jealousy and envy came out with really bad results. So we have this intersection in, of high intelligence, someone who presented as this country gentleman, intersecting with someone who had the instincts to kill if he needed to. And this was just not something that the people in the Gilded Age had really experienced before. So when he was finally caught after 30 years of causing crime and mayhem, it was pretty stunning to see the, the person who they thought was going to be a monster, and he really wasn't. That was part of the fascination people had with him was his intel or his intelligence or, you know, the fact that he was so smart. And maybe that's one reason why he escaped justice for so long. Mm -hmm. Is that in your estimation, one reason why? Or? I think so. You know, he he represented himself in court often and, and did a really wonderful job when given the opportunity. And w part of what happens in this book is that, you know, I take a criminal who was, a, the Edward Ruloff was, I consider the avatar for people wanting to study the criminal mind because he was the antithesis of what people believed a criminal would be in this time period, particularly somebody who had killed his wife and child and his sister-in-law and, and her child. And so when he, um, you know, when, when you have somebody who is that intelligent, who can then, you know, move seamlessly through society, we start thinking of criminals that we know of now. Ted Bundy would be one, Edmund Kemper would be another, who are incredibly intelligent. And again, that scare factor of, the, the, if you have an Edward Ruloff or a Ted Bundy you're not going to recognize them because they're so charming. And that is, I think, what petrifies people who read about true crime. And I think that, you know, when you're, when you're exploring the idea of somebody like him, you start to realize how he got away with it for so long, representing himself in court, so did Ted Bundy. Um, you know, uh, someone who could outthink authority and really played on that idea that people did not expect this of someone who, who was not crazed and wild-eyed and spouting off things that were insensible. I mean, this was this was someone who was who was really gifted and so it was unexpected. Well, it was jealousy that kind of prompted him to murder his wife, mm -hmm. Harriet, and poison their their baby, mm -hmm. their infant daughter, Priscilla. 
Uh, so he he was he was jealous of Dr. Bull. Mm -hmm. Is it Henry Bull? I the think? very handsome Dr. Yeah. Henry Bull. Yes, who was actually Harriet's cousin. But every you know even a you know platonic sort of affection, he got very angry about right. that. Right. Um, so that fits with what you just said about you know if he if he felt something was in his way or something was you know he he just had the sense of jealousy. He would just without remorse do these sorts of things. Yeah, and what, what we know now, and that's a lot of this book is what we knew then about the criminal mind versus what we know now. What we know now is that it's not mental illness that causes people to kill. There are many people who have mental illnesses and personality disorders who don't kill. There is often a trigger though. And with Ruloff, the trigger was Dr. Bull at the very beginning. Um, incredible amounts of jealousy he had never felt before. and. Not in Ruloff's defense, but an explanation is that in the 1800s, being involved in marrying your first cousin was not unusual at all. It was encouraged because, it, you know, the dating pool was smaller because travel was harder. And this was a way to sort of marrying your cousin was a way to, to, to keep the family together. And so Dr. Bull was a legitimate threat to, to Edward Ruloff. So when he became abusive initially of Harriet, her family did something that was really unusual and they're very proud of actually the Scuts now, was that when he was abusive and her, one of her older brothers walked in on this, he said, that's it. If you don't straighten up and keep your hands off of her, we are taking her back which now seems like a no-brainer for any family would probably do that. But in the 1800s, once a man married a woman, he was essentially her owner. She was property. So for her to, for her family to say we would engage in a divorce and we would take her back, it would bring some level of shame to the Scuts. That is how serious they thought this was. That was a, a very grave situation to them. And, and I thought that was really impressive. So. There are um, an awful lot of stressors for Edward Ruloff, which is what psychologists say, you know, point to when killers start doing what they do, is there are stressors, there are triggers, um, and, and certainly Dr. Bull represented a pretty big trigger for him. But he never admitted to William's family, William Scott's family, his, his wife and daughter also died yeah. mysteriously, and there was some question about whether that was poisoning or something else or he so the story behind that was that you know William Scott who was her um, second eldest brother had grown tired of hearing about Dr. Bull he had had enough and Ruloff had given him an ultimatum Edward said either Dr. Bull goes or I go and William essentially said well you're gonna go because this is our cousin and nothing's happening you're being crazy and so Ruloff felt very betrayed that his brother-in-law was not defending him and when William's wife gave birth and both mother and daughter became very ill, which was common, a childbirth fever is what they called it, which was essentially a, a bacterial infection, most likely. When they became ill, um, Edward was a, a botanical doctor. Why they didn't go track down Dr. Bull, I don't know, who was an actual physician, but he was a botanical doctor. He was there and William was panicked and he said, can you please come treat them? And he did with some herbs and very quickly after both died. So this could have been an accident, absolutely. This could have been the herbs he gave them um, weren't effective against the fever that she and, and Emile, the daughter, had. But the, the crux of it was that he had a, a very disturbing discussion with his mother-in-law, the, the matriarch of the family, Hannah, in which he just essentially said, I killed them and I will f then kill Harriet and um, my daughter because he wanted revenge for William really not taking his side. And because men in the 19th century were often very melodramatic and Edward Ruloff was beyond melodramatic, they didn't take him seriously. I mean, this would have been, a, for me, this would have been absolutely a threat and an admission. And when the journalist confronted him 30 years later about the statement, he just said, yeah, I probably did say that, I, I don't know. But he was very vague. And in the field of journalism, it's dangerous to become very close to your subject. And by the time this story came up, the journalist sitting in his jail cell, Hamilton Freeman, had become very close to Edward.
So he did not pursue lines of questioning that I certainly would have pursued. So that was left very vague also. Um, and when they exhumed their bodies, it was inconclusive. They couldn't tell one way or the other at that point. So I think it's likely he was vindictive enough, but I think the intent was um, to cause a lot of damage to William, which he did. So Harriet Scott's family was a, was primarily brothers, mm -hmm. and they were very protective of her. And this whole murder of Harriet and the infant daughter really haunted them for yeah. decades. Still does, and I would say the, you know, when I talk to families now who have loved ones who are missing, it's torturous, it's, it's terrible, and Harriet, uh, Edward had confessed to one person only, a journalist named Hamilton Freeman. And he said he killed Harriet, and he was very vague about what happened to his daughter Priscilla. But he said he killed Harriet and took her out into, her body out into the middle of Lake Cayuga and dumped it into the middle of the lake. They dragged the lake, which was an incredible amount of money and effort for the 1840s, and couldn't find her. And so I think that when her parents died, it was just terrible. You know, her mother ultimately was able to testify against him and then died very shortly after. So I think that, that those are qualities that when I talk to families in my podcasts or in the books, those are qualities that they are very proud of. The Scots are incredibly proud of that. The perseverance that from the very beginning, they've pursued him for 30 years until they felt like they got some level of justice, which ultimately seeing him hanged was not as satisfactory as, as they thought. And a lot, I think a lot of families feel like that. Ultimately, you know, Harriet and Priscilla were gone. So it was, it was a difficult, it was an, it's an interesting story, but a difficult story for them to know how much damage one person could do in their family, four people dead in one family. Well, you actually talked to the descendants of the Scott family. I did. Yeah, yeah. I visited the farm, too. What did all that tell you in your research, going to the location, meeting the family? I think it's really important for somebody who I, I write in a category called narrative nonfiction. So, you know, the, it's nonfiction that reads like fiction. In order to do that, in order to talk about the murder of crows that lives in the large tree behind the house, for it to be authentic, you have to be there. You have to, to be able to look down the well that Ruloff looked down. And um, there's a creek that runs right behind the property. There's the barn that's still there that he worked in. So to have all of that sort of visceral evidence in front of you, for me, that's the only way I can rebuild that world. I can't do it any other way. And I was just lucky to have a lot of that. But for every book that I write and every podcast that I do, I have to be able to go to the locations and you know like I have a two seasons coming up for my first podcast. This is a show that's documentary style. I go and I visit all the locations and I have family members with me and we'll go to grave sites, we'll go to where the murders happen, we'll interview people and I have a woman who's meeting me who contacted me. She has two murders in her family that are 180 years apart but in the same family related mm -hmm. and um, so, you know, we're going to meet in New England, and, and I go and visit all the sites with her, and it, it's very, very important for me. I don't understand a writer who can just get everything in the mail and create this book. You can't, to me, you can't do that. You have to go to the archives. You have to go and dig in and take the time to do it. You seem like a really nice person. <laughs> And very normal. So how did you get so involved in the uh, making the criminal mind your life? You know, it's uh, it's funny because um, when we talk about being you know normal and people ask, are you? Does it feel like you're? Are you always? Have you always been interested in the macabre like this? And I have. My dad was a law professor at the University of Texas for 37 years, and he started the actual innocence clinic there. And with that clinic, you know, we, we would talk a lot about um, junk science, wrongful convictions. And then my mother was a clinical psychologist who's now retired and is a really, really big fan of true crime. Mm -hmm. So I think people have asked me a lot, well, what do you think, this resurgence of true crime, and true crime is really having a moment. And true crime has never had, there's no resurgence, it has been, one of the most popular genres 
for hundreds of years at Ruloff's execution, there were thousands of people who came. They came to public executions. It was a opportunity to bring your kids to have a picnic and to watch somebody be hanged. This has just been part of not just American life, but around the world, the idea of seeing someone, number one, get their comeuppance, if, if that's what you believe, that an execution is a comeuppance. And number two, just trying to, to look at someone and say, I, why can this person do that and I, and I can't? And so I, I think that that fascination is what my readers and the listeners of the podcast are just, they just are fixated on it. And I am too. I, I'm, I've always been interested in the criminal mind. And I think it's mostly from my parents, for sure. <laughs> Well, you mentioned Hamilton, and he's called Ham yeah. in the book. Um, he did strike me as someone who was at times almost an advocate. He was. He was, an, and I think we've seen that before. Norman Mailer was an advocate for a, a prisoner who had been convicted of murder, and then when Mailer advocated for him and he got out, he ended up killing somebody else. It happens. Journalists and convicts or journalists and people who were in prison have uh, transactional relationships, certainly. Ted Bundy had a pair of journalists who wrote several books about him, and he confided in them. And it's dangerous. It's a dangerous prospect because it is clear to me that Edward Ruloff had psychopathy. Somebody with psychopathy who is manipulative to the level that Edward Ruloff was and Ted Bundy and many of the other people that the FBI has spoken with over the last century and a half, um, these are people who are experts at manipulating, even journalists who are, are pretty savvy. So it was um, once Ruloff decided that he had a local journalist who he could manipulate in this book to essentially write his own narrative. And then he had a nationally known journalist who was fascinated with his theory, who, were, who was printing large excerpts of this you know, wacky theory of his in a, in a newspaper that was read around the world. Those two people, these members of the media, he was able to leverage really well to kind of get his way and to stay alive for much longer than he probably should have. Well, he was a chameleon because he, he, you know, he lived these two separate lives for several decades and because of his intelligence was able to charm and fool people mm -hmm. and then would support himself doing, having somebody, a little gang do petty robberies, mm -hmm. you know, yep. it was, he could, he was really, I think you said pathological sort of liar. He was, and what's interesting about somebody like Ruloff is you would think he has this, you, you alluded to this crime ring that he created, which was, you know, a couple of criminals who he would tutor languages during the day to, and then at night they would rob silk merchants, and then they had a couple of sort of freelancers who worked with them. So you would think that he would have taken the money and lived a much better life, but he spent all of the money on this one cruddy little apartment in Irving Plaza that where they where they would come and go but really it was he was spending money on books and supplies cuz he was hyper focused which is what happens with somebody with psychopathy hyper focused on this one goal which was to finish this manuscript that he was convinced would earn everybody hundreds of thousands of dollars so his goal and his focus was to totally support his academic research and you know you would have I mean he rarely he didn't wear clothes very often he barely ate he didn't smoke he didn't drink there were none of the vices that probably every man in Manhattan had in the 1870s he ignored because he he really his legacy was was lying in the pages of that manuscript and he believed that manuscript was going to make him a, a world-renowned academic scholar. Yep. It would be innovative. He'd be famous. Yep. Yeah. And so when he is caught during one of these robberies because he kills someone and he goes on trial, he is it essentially just says, let me finish this manuscript. I'm not quite sure what you need to do with me after that, but the manuscript's the most important thing. And you had some very influential people, including Mark Twain and Horace Greeley, who was running for president the next year, who were, were writing in and saying, why don't we just you know, save this man's life? But there was a, a very big debate um, within the state of New York about what to do with this man. Do we let him finish this? So the 
the uh, New York New York's governor were sending in a group of, of people to try to really sort out. Was he really smart? Was he that intelligent? What was there credence to this theory? Do we keep him alive? Do we send him to to send him to an asylum, which a um you know a, an insane asylum, which we would now call a mental health facility? An insane asylum in the 1800s was just a half a step up from being executed. It was terrible. So Ruloff was determined to be counted as sane because he didn't want his theory to be discredited. Because if he were declared legally insane, then who would believe this theory to begin with? Well, you're a crime historian, and you know a lot about these pathologies of criminals. And I think, I believe you said at one point that um, a psychopath is not really a mental illness, being it's a not, psychopath. Right. That's, see, that's interesting to me because I think today, I mean, I would be saying, oh, someone, you know, that's just somebody who's really ill, mentally ill, who does that kind of thing. Right. But how is it different? Well, you know, a personality disorder is not a mental illness, and a personality disorder generally is not treated uh, by medicine, and certainly um, psychopathy can't be treated by medicine. I've interviewed two or three people who have been diagnosed by a, a real psychologist or psychologist, psychiatrist with um, psychopathy. And so when I interviewed them, I wanted to know a little bit more about the way they were thinking. And I said to, uh, you know, one person, one woman, so, if you have a cat of 10 years, and this is a cat that you know, you've know that you grown up with, it's somebody you've loved, and you run over this cat, you back over the cat in the driveway, what is your feeling? And she said, I would not feel remorse for hitting the cat because it hurt the cat. Um, I would feel badly for myself for being inconvenienced by running over this cat. It is always about that person, and it is, a marked lack of empathy and remorse. Psychologists have found and researchers have found the best way to treat someone with psychopathy because there's no medicine. Really, I mean, shock therapy, there's nothing that's gonna work with somebody with psychopathy. It's ingrained in your brain. And what they said was that you have to convince them that working within the boundaries of society is what's best. You will not get your way if you act out so that is the only way is what am I going to get out of good behavior? Most of us don't rob a bank because that's not the right thing to do. We've been taught that. Mm -hmm. People don't kill because of a mental illness. And I think that's a misconception that we have in our society. You know, people who go on shooting sprees or, or you know, are serial killers and later they are diagnosed with a, a mental illness. It's not the mental illness that did that. There are plenty of people who have mental illness who don't, aren't violent to anyone. Um, but it is typically triggers. There are things, it's a combination of things. It's nature and nurture. Mm -hmm. And in Ruloff's time, they believed it was only nature. They did not think it was nurture. You were born evil. You are destined to die on the scaffold, on the gallows, and that's it. And I should say a lot of the book is about really what, what, was learned along the way and maybe wrongly learned but it eventually his brain was studied he was yeah. and other you know gilded age sort of researchers at the time now you know techniques that are no longer used but sort of the predecessors to modern criminal forensics yeah. and, and psychology he was studied by people like that like an alienist for mm -hmm. example will you tell us what that is so an alienist is a um, is a, a archaic term for a psychiatrist really it would be a forensic psychiatrist so you know one of the things that Ruloff did that I loved I found so interesting was there's this moment for six months when he's shackled to the floor of a jail in Binghamton awaiting execution and it keeps getting delayed because he becomes more and more confusing to people who are experts who come in. So there's an, an expert in languages who thinks he's absolutely brilliant. But what threw him was his psychopathy. A forensic psychiatrist told me that someone with psychopathy will always foul their own nest, which means they cannot get out of their own way. If he had, with his brain, with his knowledge, his ability and his passion for languages, if he had pushed his ego and his insecurities aside, and gone on to join a university, which he absolutely could have, and had been invited to be a full-time faculty member at a university in North Carolina. If he had gone on and done that, he would have made 
I'm certain, some groundbreaking theories in linguistics. But because of this psychopathy, I think that he, he could not manage to do any of that. He was self-sabotaging. So, um, you know, I think that, that the idea of Edward Ruloff being this genius who then needs to be studied after he's been executed is brilliant. He wanted to be, he wanted to make history and he did, and this was not the way he intended. He thought he was gonna go down as a legacy in linguistics. And when his brain was studied, it was the beginning of comparative anatomy in the United States because he was the very first brain purchased in the first brain collection, brain museum in the country. And uh, before Ruloff, the idea was that the wealthy, intelligent, morally upright white men would have the biggest and the highest quality brains. And everybody else's brains, the inferior brains, people of color, people who are mentally ill, criminals, women, they would be smaller or deformed, criminals would have a mark on their brain that everything will be very clear. All criminals will look the same, their brains will look the same. And uh, when Ruloff, finally, when they managed to, to crack into his skull and saw his brain, it was very heavy and it was very large. And we now know that that size does not matter when it comes to intelligence. But when you took his brain and the basic structure and the folds and the fissures and the way it looked, there was no mark of a criminal on it, and you compared it to the brain of the elite white man and of the female and of the black man and line them all up, there were no differences. And this was groundbreaking in the beginning of neuroscience in the United States. Mostly what we learned, I think, from Ruloff's brain is that his brain was not significantly different aside from the weight. The structure of it was very similar to any other brain. You know, and, and this was um, a, a debunking of a scientific racist theory that had gone on for hundreds of years. And now all of a sudden, Burt Greenwilder, who is at the NAACP um, conference, is displaying his brain alongside all of these other brains and saying, you cannot now say that inferior people with inferior brains need to be controlled exclusively by white people because their brains are no worse and no better. And that was pretty remarkable. So he was a, like a psychologist, the head of the psychology department and Cornell called him, um, a, he was akin to one of Darwin's finches. He was, you know, an illustration of something that was needed and had not been seen before. It's actually a pretty big contribution to the world. <laughs> yeah, it was, and, it was, and it, he was buried in history. So what do you think it is if it's not nature, given from looking at the brain, and, you know, it's not, I mean, is it nurture? But his, his background wasn't terribly fraught. It, was, it, it was, wasn't. No, not for something. I'm sure that his father was strict, but it didn't sound like more strict than anyone, no. any other parent mm -hmm. in the 19th century. He had a mother who loved him and um, who gave him a love of academia that he pursued later on. He didn't seem to have trauma in life. I think that somebody asked me the other day, do you think people are born evil? And I said, no, I really don't. I think that there are things that happen in their lives. I think you can pre be predisposed to things like psychopathy. Um, but I think much of the time, there are people who have things that happen in their lives um, that influenced them later on, but so does much of the world. Kate Winkler Dawson, thank you so much for being here today to talk about All That Is Wicked. Fascinating story, and I wish you all the best with it and your podcast. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's strenuous work to saw through a skull. The job demands an anatomist with dexterity, diligence, physical strength, and a sharpened blade. But the rewards of such physical exertion are great. The brain uncovered beneath the thick layer of bone might prove invaluable to science. This one certainly did. Tucked deep inside a steel-clad brown building at one of the most respected universities in the United States sits the brain of a brilliant killer, Edward Ruloff. <laughs>